Good evening. My name is Jenny Hess and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, Maryland's program, Eliminating Institutional Bias, How New Montgomery County Public School Data and Inclusive Thinking Could Help. Our panelists will give us insight into how MCPS's planned anti-racist system audit can identify disparities in students' academic performance, social and emotional experiences, and staff development opportunities to fix inequities. We will also hear more about the role parents and families can play in furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion in education. And finally, what critical race theory has to do with any of this? Critical race theory is a term we have heard a lot lately, but the details are still unclear for many people. Hopefully tonight we can dispel myths and foster better understanding about this college level framework and why it's become part of the national conversation around race and equity. But first some housekeeping details. This webinar is presented by the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. The meeting is being recorded and is being streamed live to Facebook. The recording will be made available at a later date on our YouTube channel. We will put some links in the chat box for Facebook and the YouTube links. The audience will be muted during the webinar. After our speakers make their presentations, we will have a question and answer session. We encourage you to ask questions, but want to remind everyone that given tonight's discussion topic, it is required that attendees be respectful and civil toward our speakers and each other. Hateful, discriminatory, and derogatory comments or personal insults against our speakers will not be tolerated. To submit a question, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question into the box, and then hit send or return. We will answer as many questions as time allows. The program is scheduled to end at 8.30. Now I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Stephanie Sharon is the Chief of Strategic Initiatives in the Office of the Superintendent of MCPS. In this role, she is charged with moving forward and coordinating initiatives to meet the needs of a diverse community through the lens of innovation and equity. Before that, she served as an Executive Director to the Deputy Superintendent, and she has been a Social Studies teacher, Assistant Principal, and Principal, all within MCPS. Rochelle Rubin is the Chief of Teaching, Learning, and Schools, also in the Office of the Superintendent of MCPS. In this role, she oversees the largest office in the school district, encompassing the departments of special education, curriculum and instructional programs, student and family support and engagement, and school support and improvement. Byron Johns is the chair of the Education Committee and Parents Council for the NAACP's Montgomery County, Maryland chapter. He is also a co-founder of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence. And he has worked with several groups to help pass bills in the Maryland General Assembly for the sake of improving the welfare of Maryland children and for addressing disparities in discipline for students of color. Janelle George is the founder and director of the Racial Equity in Education Law and Policy Clinic at Georgetown University. She is an associate professor at Georgetown University Law Center and her clinical research has focused on the development and implementation of legislative interventions to advance racial equity in education at the local, state, and federal levels. It is my pleasure to invite Stephanie Sharon and Rochelle Rubin to begin tonight's program. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, we are extremely excited to join uh, the program tonight and to really talk about the anti-racist system audit that is currently ongoing in Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, my colleague and I will take turns sharing some slides this evening, and uh, we really want to focus on why we are engaging in the anti-racist audit, what the audit entails, and what we want to do with the results once we have them. 
Um, others on this panel will speak to the ideas behind, as you've heard, um, critical race theory. However, we wanted to be clear that while our system has historically focused on equity and engaged in uh, work around equity, we do not teach critical race theory as a part of our curriculum in MCPS. Um, and we certainly um, have, have as part of our core values um, that we don't condone blaming or shaming of anyone. So that does not mean, however, that we ignore race and the significant role that it plays in the lives of many of those who are part of our school system. Um, so we've had a longstanding commitment to providing students with the tools necessary to explore the evolution of our nation, its institutions, and the policies through a lens that accurately reflects the experience of all communities and our and cultures. Next slide, please. So this slide is um, illustrative of uh, something that many of you may be familiar with. Um, like many young people across the country last year, MCPS students at almost every high school in our district and many middle schools started Instagram accounts to share their experiences about what it's like to be Black in MCPS, as they call this movement. These accounts say that they are a safe space where alumni and current students can share their experiences with racism or discrimination. If you have some free time later and would like to know uh, what our students think or those who were with us at one point, please take a few minutes to search Black at and you can insert any one of our high schools. Um, these feelings didn't start last year, though. Uh, what you will see in here is that students from all backgrounds frequently testify before the Board of Education, create campaigns to push their teachers, principals, and even our superintendent to think differently about how we do our work. They want us to work harder to understand the diverse experiences of our student body and to include that history and the voices of all diverse uh, society. So these Instagram posts really illustrate um, that students have felt that we were not meeting those goals on some level. Um, however, we do strive to teach a full and factual history of the American experience, including events um, and policies that have contributed to structural racism. We encourage all of our students to consider the past, examine their present, and really to work to be allies with one another to make a better future that is free from racist practices, attitudes, and systems of the past. And that's where the anti-racist system audit comes in. As adults, we really cannot ask our students to do things that we are unwilling to do, no matter how painful or politically challenging they may be. Next slide. So this slide really gets into what the anti-racist system audit is all about. Um, if you take a look, you will see that racial disparities can be seen in almost every area of MCPS from our reading levels, participation in higher level classes, graduation rates, suspension and discipline, or as we're referring to it now, behavioral health management, as well as staffing. And so while there have been many reports and initiatives to understand and address racial gaps in Montgomery County Public Schools, the anti-racist audit is really the first time that MCPS is implementing a comprehensive analysis across all policies and systems within our district. As you can see from the graphic on the screen, there are really six areas that we are analyzing as a result of the audit in order to gain a more comprehensive analysis of our district. So I'll just touch on a few key points so, so as not to belabor the slide, but it's important to know the components of the audit. So first we have our workforce diversity analysis. And this really is our work to make sure that we are looking at ensuring that we are hiring for quality and expertise, but also for diversity in all areas of MCPS 
that's really significant because as we take a look at the students who are in our classrooms, who are in our school system, we want them to really be able to see themselves reflected in the individuals who are in the front of the classrooms. So the next component um, has to do with work conditions and progress and barriers. Um, we acknowledge that the well-being of staff is significant to the education of our students, right? That is why our Be Well 365 initiative encompasses not only the well-being of students, but staff as well. And so we are responsible for ensuring that the work environment in every office, division, school is one that creates acknowledgement addresses the complexities around race, diversity, and inclusion, and how these things factor into everyone's personal, physical, psychological, social, and emotional well-being. Our next uh, component is pre-K to 12 equity curriculum review. We really want to conduct a pre-K to 12 curriculum review through an anti-racist lens. We have heard from many of our students over time about how our social studies curriculum is taught and how the feeling is that it, it negates a full picture of the context that addresses African American history and many of the contributions by African Americans and other indigenous people. And so what we're looking to do there is to really take a look at how that negation has an impact on mental health. Um, and really contributes to the public health crisis um, that many have now acknowledged is part of um, our systems. And then we have our equity achievement framework process where schools really must look at this data to acknowledge if progress is being made with students of color and populations who have historically been marginalized. If they are not making progress, how do we rectify that? How do we level the playing field? We're also really, really hyper-focused and considering the impact of the pandemic and how, it's, uh, how it has have, had an effect on our students, the focus of academics and how we plan for that, right? How do we close that gap? And how do we make sure that all of our students are learning and if they aren't learning enough, what do we do? And how do we make sure that we have a plan to address that going forward? Uh, another component is community relations and engagement, uh, which tonight is a perfect reflection of that. We really must continue to engage all communities um, at the central level, as well as at the school level. Um, when we think about that African proverb, a child who is not embraced by the village ultimately turns upon that village to feel its warmth. It's really critical for each of our schools to be really relentless and tireless about the outreach and engagement of all our communities so that all voices and perspectives are heard. And that's where that community relations and engagement component is a significant part of the anti-racist audit. And then finally, um, the evaluation of school cultures. Our students, as, as has been mentioned, are really crying out for support as evidenced by the creation of the multiple social media pages where they had the opportunity to share their experiences with racism within our schools. Um, we've had multiple hate bias related incidents that have required us to send letters to the community, to really hold community meetings and forums, to really engage in those restorative process and practices where healing can take place. And so we really see it as significant that we are proactive in every way to teach all of our students about the hurt and harm that happens when um, some of these experiences arise. And so uh, the evaluation of school cultures becomes a significant part of our work. And so now we're going to go to our next slide where there's a video and we really wanted you to have the opportunity to hear the voices of students, parents, and staff about why they think we need an anti-racist system audit in Montgomery County Public Schools.
I think the audit is important to give MCPS a baseline of what's happening in the schools. We need this to happen so that we can share our experiences and help ensure that MCPS is an inclusive, anti-racist school district. It's necessary for us to understand how this is impacting our own students and families. Students can't learn unless we start with this. A lot of students either aren't aware of the issues occurring or they don't know how to address them. So I think that the audit will definitely be a great start to that. There is always more to be done in terms of being anti-racist and being strict and making sure that we are pushing an anti-racist agenda and notion to make sure and make it clear that racism has no place in MCPS. Anybody that's delivering a such crucial service to the county needs to be constantly examining themselves, their practices, and how what they're delivering are benefiting the broad community. This audit is calling MCPS to be vulnerable and really name where we have fallen short, where we have um, supported systems of oppression or where our systems are racist. But the benefit to naming and being vulnerable is that we are then a leader in the nation um, in that way and it also that's the only way we can change. I want to just see change happen. I think a lot of what occurs now is just a lot of talk sometimes about what we want to get done whether that's just through students talking about what they want to see done or teachers so I really do feel like if we do have a conversation like this there can be actual change implemented. If we're going to do the audit and not do anything with the results with the data we have failed so we need to do the audit understand the results and then use that data to improve and set policies going forward. I definitely would like to see changes in the Montgomery County curriculum, especially in terms of like history. I would like to see it more inclusive in terms of different races and religions and ethnicities, everything. Just creating those integrated environments is something that I think is really important. Just making sure that students are able to attend classes with people of different backgrounds from them. It, definitely does add to your educational experience. Schools have always seemed to me as a microcosm of society. And so uh, in order to have systemic change and to be disruptors of stru structural racism, um, you need to make sure that this work is at the forefront and that it never goes away and that we, we keep focused on it. The MCPS needs to stay at the forefront if they want to be considered uh, one of the school systems that's truly closing the gap and making a difference for every kid. I want to be able to say that not only was I a part of, but my child was a product of a school system where he was valued, his culture was valued, administrators were passionate, our school board followed up. I want to ensure that every student, that every parent, that every teacher, everyone feels valued and that we work together to ensure that our children will be the future leaders and we will be the example of what it means to be an equitable, proficient school system. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna introduce you that. Oh. <laughs> Take it away, Stephanie. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Rubin. So Ms. Rubin just took you through um, and did a great job with kind of giving you the high level around what the audit is and why it's so critical that we engage in it. What I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is what does the audit actually entail and what do we hope to get out of it? So before we do that, however, I'd like to go through a, two definitions with you. One of the issues that I believe is one of the challenges in discussing race in our country is that oftentimes we come to the table with different definitions of what we mean when we say racism or anti-racism. And part of what frustrates people is that we might be in the same conversation, but we're actually talking about two very different things. So in our society, and certainly in public education, it's critical that we're clear about the terms that we use. So I do just wanna take a moment and just share with you that this is the definition of racism that we are using as a system in MCPS. The systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another. Racism plays out on multiple levels. It can be internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and systemic. 
This is our active and, and working definition of anti-racism that we're using in Montgomery County Public Schools. In Montgomery County Public Schools, we believe that anti-racism is actively working to ensure racial justice by identifying, interrupting, and dismantling racist practices, policies, and attitudes that disproportionately harm communities of color. So when we're talking about our anti-racist racist system audit, this is the lens with which we are looking at. So what you see on this screen here um, is a summary of the different data collections that are being used in the audit. We are working with uh, Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, um, which is a consultant uh, that we have hired in order to have an objective view of our system from all angles, from all policies and practices. And they're doing this through a variety of different uh, data collection methods. They started last year in December of 2020, reviewing our documents and existing data. MCPS is extremely rich in having um, quali uh, quantitative data. We have a lot of data and we've done a lot of studies so far. And what we didn't want is for the anti-racist audit to be something that was just repeating the work that we have already done. In addition, there has been a lot of really great work done around race and equity within MCPS. And we didn't want the consultant to repeat that work, but wanted to see where we were at in time so that we could, they could create a plan to figure out how to evaluate where we need to go. Then in May of May 2021 to July of 2021, all leadership teams in all 209 schools, as well as all offices in central office, engaged in an equity audit tool. This was an opportunity for leadership teams to self-assess their progress towards a ver the variety of components that exist and that were identified as those six areas of the audit. January 23rd to February 28th, and this is coming up, um, is going to be our stakeholder surveys of students, staff, parents, and the community. We want to maximize the opportunity to get as many stakeholders um, to respond to the surveys as possible. Um, all students in grades four through 12 will have the opportunity to participate in the survey. Uh, parents will have the opportunity um, and students will have the opportunity to opt out of the survey, but we are going to give the, everybody an opportunity. The survey questions for our fourth and fifth graders do look different because we wanted to make sure that they were age appropriate. And then we also are going to be engaging in a series of focus groups, town halls, and visits um, to classrooms that we are going to do to, summer, to, to complete the audit. Our goal is that our audit will be done by May or June of this year. And the other thing to note is that each of these data collections build on each other. And they're triangulated to show a bit the big picture. So no one um, uh, data collection should stand on its own. It can, but in order to get a complete picture, they will be triangulated with each other in order to show the patterns and trends and to ultimately make recommendations moving forward. So I did just want to say, since our stakeholder survey is the one that is coming up, the, the, the soonest, it's the, it's the one that we're about to do, to do. Um, there are eight different surveys that are going to be administered, as I noted before. And this was really a collaborative effort, not just with Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. They created the initial survey, but then we, did, we worked with our steering committee, our equity initiatives unit, student focus groups, various advocacy groups, elementary school teachers, and parents in order to gain feedback, fine tune, and adjust the survey accordingly to best meet the needs of our unique community within MCPS. So what? This is the big question we get asked a lot. Uh, prior to starting the anti-racist audit, the Equity Initiatives Unit and the Deputy Superintendent's Office engaged over 150 stakeholders. And one of the, the things that was asked of the stakeholders prior to even starting the audit was, what do you want to get out of it? And you know, what do you hope to achieve by this? And although you know, a lot of people talked about having a system that was free of racism, closing the achievement gap, one consistent comment that we heard was one of skepticism. And many reported that they were fearful that this was just going to become another report on the shelf 
and that nothing was really going to change about that. And based on our history, we can understand where that fear is coming from. So I wanna be clear about some of the initial steps we're taking to make sure that this does not happen. First, I want to make sure that it's clear and everyone understands that this initiative is not about one person or one department within MCPS. The Board of Education deliberated on this and voted unanimously to conduct this audit. So regardless of office, regardless of who's in what position, the board is going to ensure that this work continues. In addition, we have a committee that is working to recommend structures that need to be put in place prior to the final results of the audit so that when the audit results come out, we are in a perfect and primed position to be able to execute immediately. Some of these structures are to create a cadre of staff and leaders across the district who have skills in leading meetings that help staff and stakeholders effectively unpack the audit results. We plan on training central office and school leaders to understand how to identify and interrupt structural racism and to lead meetings with an anti-racist lens. In addition, we're gonna talk about how we can utilize our school improvement planning processes to specifically address the issues identified in the audit. We're also gonna be developing cross office teams charged with addressing district wide issues. All of these items are a way for us to ensure that we're actually going to implement in a proactive way, the results when we receive them. So I do just wanna say as some of my closing comments that, you know, although um, the good news is, is that we're not starting from scratch. MCPS has really been engaged in decades long work around, the, around equity and uh, race and bias for many years. And what you see on this screen are just some of examples of modules, training and, and tools that we have for staff and leaders to help build their capacity around this critical work in the system. The purpose of the audit is to get to the, to the next level and ensure that everything that we're doing is coming from a system-wide approach of a lens of anti-racism and equity. So I just wanna thank you all for giving both Ms. Rubin and myself the time today to talk about our work and we welcome input and your ideas and questions um, and your help as we engage in this difficult but vitally important work. We do have a website that includes FAQs, updates, and um, a bunch of different updates on the work. And you can see that the website is right there. And we welcome um, you to, to check it out and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you both. And now it's my pleasure to invite Byron Johns to present. Well, good evening. Um, pleasure to be here with you and uh, again, I am with the uh, NAACP uh, Montgomery County branch and also a co-founder with the Black and Brown uh, Coalition. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, just a, a brief idea of the concepts of critical race theory. It's been in the news a lot and there's quite a bit of confusion and different, diff different definitions as was mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, a lot of terms you heard from my colleagues and friends at MCPS, uh, restorative justice and structural racism. There's a lot of different words that get packed in under the label of critical race theory. Um, I wanna unpack some of that and give some context for that for folks. At least it's my definition. So you're free to use it or you can choose to use whatever other versions you, uh, you get from the news. So here's a little about um, critical race theory. So, you know, first off, it's not a new idea. This is something, uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, it's, you know, 50 years old. Actually, um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund attorney and a Harvard professor, Derek Bell, and one of his students, Kimberly Crenshaw, really kind of formu formulated the idea. And it was initially just as a criticism to the feelings of the uh, Brown versus Board decision that it really had not created equal, uh, equal educational opportunities. And it was further developed by um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and others to really more broadly look at why racial inequities and inequalities persisted even through the uh, civil rights laws and the victories in the 60s along the way. Um, Many of these things, uh, if 
the injustices that had existed for years before uh, persisted. So um, the way I would frame it, critical race theory is centered on the idea that racism is systemic and not just demonstrated by individuals and prejudices. Um, the theory, and again, it is a theory, is that racial inequality is woven into the legal systems and you'll see it in uh, manifest itself in housing practices, schools, employment, uh, criminal justice system, and countless other areas. So what it is not is, and notice my, uh, I thought this cartoon was, was very telling, you know, critical race theory in many right, is what has been going on um, to push back against it. So uh, it, the term has been hijacked. Uh, it, is, it is a term that is, um, as was mentioned, it is taught in not even all law schools, but it's a very advanced uh, set of theories around the impact in, in law. But it's certainly not specifically taught in kindergarten through 12th, uh, 12th grade, K through 12 schools. And it is certainly not to indoctrinate children to hate America. I mean, that is literally uh, what has been, you know, falsely claimed by some that have a, a different agenda. So, you know, opponents are really, I, I believe, um, have a broader intent to roll back efforts and progressive policies related to anti-racism. Um, right across the river, we've seen uh, efforts couched as critical race theory that are um, really antithetical and opposing the kind of work that we just heard our colleagues at MCPS um, doing. And really they're trying to stave off, uh, in my opinion, any redress to past and present discrimination against people of color. So, you know, what really came to a head is in 2020, uh, Trump issued an executive order abolishing CRT and anti-racism training in the federal government. And then followed, that was followed by 28 states introduced bills to ban uh, teaching of race, race-related history, um, racism, sexism. I mean, if you look at it, um, it's, it's quite extraordinary how, you know, something uh, as much as trying to teach history has now become such a political uh, third rail for, for teachers. So, so one of the things in terms of context, I think is important, what was before critical race theory? And there is a term eugenics, and many people are not really familiar with it these days, but this was a term that really pretty much up until the late 50s, I would say even early 60s, was pretty much accepted um, as a belief in many, many parts of America. So eugenics promotes that certain races possess genetic superior traits and others are genetically inferior. That's its fundamental tenet. And frankly, that was manifest itself in many areas. I would tell you that even as recently as last month, the NFL just settled where they no longer use race when there is an injury, um, they were using race, uh, race-based norming, they call it, to decline uh, payment of, of injury settlements to uh, black and you know people of color in there. So this is not a uh, far-fetched, this is not a, a, an ancient practice. This is still embedded. Um, Eugenics was also the basis for sterilization of Native American women and forced pregnancies, um, marriage restrictions. You had right here in Maryland, you had them in Virginia, for instance. So we don't have to go too far. The Nazi extermination policies against uh, Jewish people was based in eugenics and uh, US segregation policies were all there. So this was the foundation for much of the policies and practices that were uh, in existence. And fundamentally, the racist theory 
that black people and other races were genetically inferior was widely embedded in America and just used as justification for the creation of these systemic barriers, discriminatory practices in education, housing, banking, you name it. So this gentleman, and I, I only pull up uh, this gentleman because I worked with him. And uh, I worked at uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories uh, in an uh, engineering and science uh, field. And he was a rather renowned person. He is a Nobel Prize winner, um, holds numerous patents, and actually has touched all of our lives because he was one of the original uh, contributors to the development of the transistor. So everything just about in your, your life now has some form of uh, electronics with it. He was one of the fundamental contributors to that. But he was also notorious for his belief and his views on race and eugenics. And one of his, uh, one of his quotes, unfortunately, um, he claimed that blacks were genetically inferior to whites on an intellectual level. And his quote was, you know, his research leads him to believe that the major cause of the American Negro's intellectual and social deficits is hereditary and racially genetic in origin, thus not remediable in a, to a major degree. Well, um, his thoughts, he has since been, uh, and, and eugenics has since been debunked widely in, through science in a number of other areas, but there were even renowned scientists who were um, promulgated these uh, racist theories. So now let's turn a little to some of the concepts. I won't go too deep into them, but the concepts that when you apply them to education um, talked about segregated and unequal facilities and programs. Um, if you look at uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, you'll see very, very striking differences in the student population between one side of the county to the other side of the county. We have uh, some parts of the county that are 5% uh, black or Latino, and we have other parts that are 95% Black and Latino in a, in a single school. So widely varies. Um, and some of that can be tied back to housing policies. Uh, we won't get into that now. Um, desperate funding and allocation of resources, and I'll unpack a little of that. Um, access to rigorous programs. We heard about some of the things that the anti-racist audit will uh, we'll be looking into also uh, disparity in discipline practices and school boundaries and uh, that, as I mentioned, you know, concentrate students of low income into certain schools. So some examples, and this is a study that was uh, conducted, MCPS commissioned uh, for data from 2017-18, and just some examples of systemic issues. Here we have data from MCPS that shows uh, lower income elementary and middle schools are much more likely to have novice principles, novice meaning less than three years experience than their wealthier schools. And, kind of like, and the, I guess the implied statement here is the wealthier schools in the county are also the whiter schools in the county. Um, that is implied there. Um, another piece of data that came out of that is similarly, is that in middle and high schools, black and Latino students from low income families are one and a half times more likely to have novice teachers than their peers. So again, novice meaning less than three years of experience. So these are systemic barriers and issues these, this, when a system that's 160,000, 165,000 students, 209 schools, these are not anomalies, one of, this is actually shows you systemic patterns baked into the way, um, the way business is being conducted. Um, another data point is black and Latino students from low income families are significantly less likely to be enrolled in seventh grade algebra. So 
two in 20 black students and one in 20 Latino students are in algebra in seventh grade at that time. And this again is 2017-2018. Um, also, the converse of that is true, is that by 12th grade, 62% of Latino students and 53 of black students from low-income families are enrolled in the least advanced math. So again, if you look at the chart um, for non-farms, the, non, the monitoring group, as it was called, 19% of students are in the lowest math versus for black students, it is going to be 53% uh, uh, and for Hispanic students, 62%. So almost uh, three times the amount. Okay, even when uh, stu black and Latino students have the same, have the highest scores in prerequisite tests. So these are the uh, park tests. Even when they have the highest, the same scores, they are enrolled in algebra at a fraction of the rate of their peers. So again, just points to systemic patterns and practices. Um, this also points to disparity in access to middle school programs, middle school magnet programs. So these are some of the enriched curriculum programs. Again, black students are roughly 20% of the student population, but there's 7% of the admitted students in uh, the magnet programs. Hispanic students are 26% of the population and 6% of the programs. So again, it just speaks to looking broadly, um, systemic patterns that need to be analyzed. So with that, I'm going to stop screen share, but I'll just comment from the standpoint of parents. Um, what parents do is they participate in uh, collectively advocating through organizations like the NAACP, uh, like their PTAs, or like the Black and Brown Coalition, which frankly uh, brought together for the first time uh, Black and Brown communities, which together represent 54% of the entire student population at MCPS. Uh, we advocate together to dismantle, first off, analyzing this data, and then advocate for policies and then hold people accountable to dismantle the systemic barriers. And when I talk about systemic barriers, it's both policies, contracts. Uh, many of these practices are baked into the contracts, uh, the culture that exists, and also practices where it's just the way that it's always been done. So those are areas that parents can get involved and certainly play a role in ensuring that uh, equity is realized through this. So thank you. Thank you, Byron. Finally, it's my pleasure to invite Janelle George to present. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join tonight. Uh, and if you all can just bear with me, I know I'm, I'm the last presenter tonight. Uh, and I will give a little bit of a legal angle uh, to what has been shared and delve a little bit deeper into critical race theory. In particular, I want to talk a little bit about the origins of critical race theory as a legal theory, some of the tenets of critical race theory that Mr. Johns already mentioned. I'll just give a, a, a little bit of legal aspect of those. And I also want to talk about the importance of public education for American democracy overall. And I'll explain a little Little bit more of what that means. So bear with me, you all. This will feel a little bit like a legal lecture <laughs> for a few moments. And I am a law professor. So uh, let's start first with context. So many times when we talk about issues uh, about racism and inequality, we think that all of this is so far in the past. But really look at the context. Look at how long slavery was an institution in our nation how long 
racial apartheid was legal in our nation, we're really not all that far away. So when we talk about things like the vestiges or the ongoing effects of inequality, let's really put it in context because it's really and truly not that long ago and the experiment of democracy that we're all embarking on is really a brave and courageous thing. Uh, so I want to just take a couple of steps back into the legal academy. As Mr. Johns mentioned, critical race theory originated in the legal academy. So you have a bunch of professors sitting around thinking about different theories to explain the relationship of the law to society. So first you had legal realists. Legal realists were actually groundbreaking for their time because the legal realists said, the law is not objective. This was like big news back then, right? People were like, what, the law is not objective? No, the law is impacted by the social and political context. And judges are also impacted by the social and political context. What we think are objective legal decisions that have been arrived at through this kind of mathematical objectivity is, are not really all that objective. So there was this movement of thought. The legal realists were followed by another uh, body of thought, critical legal studies, or the crits as they were known. So the crits built upon what with, with the legal realists said, and they said, okay, well, the law is not objective, but not only is the law not objective, the law itself actually plays a role in maintaining an unjust social order. And so the crits were truly radical. And they said, well, if the law maintains an unjust social order, let's just get rid of it, right? The law is bad. Let's destabilize the law. Well, you had folks like the late professor, Harvard Law professor, Derek Bell, who as Mr. Johns mentioned, had been an attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So he had litigated school desegregation cases and he thought, mm, destabilize the law. Yes, the law can function to oppress people, but the law can also be a tool of emancipation. He had seen that the law could be very valuable to the subordinated, but that wasn't Bell's only critique with the uh, crits. The critique was also, where was the role of race? What role did the law play in race relations and in impacting racial inequality? And so Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, a law professor at UCLA and Columbia Law, who now heads the African American Policy Forum, said there is a different way of viewing this. So their theory was critical race theory. And critical race theory was, a again, a legal approach. This was a legal theory for trying to understand what is the role of the law in replicating racial inequality. They were trying to figure out, as Mr. Johns pointed out, why do we still have, after these civil rights milestones, like the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, or the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954, why do we still have the endurance of racial inequality in America? And what they concluded was the law was playing a role. So Kimberly Crenshaw, who I noted was one of the originators, critical race theory, she actually coined the term critical race theory. Crenshaw says critical race theory is a verb. It's not a noun. It's a way of examining the role of law and I think even of policy in reproducing racial inequality in a post-civil rights era. So as Mr. Johns noted this theory, it really took root in the 70s, grew in the 80s, and now it applies to other fields, has been applied in other fields of scholarship besides the law, including in education and in sociology. But you had these legal scholars, uh, it, it, along with Bell and Crenshaw, you've also had uh, Richard Delgado, Gene Stefanczyk, Mari Matsuda, Cheryl Harris, many, many others who have used this approach to examine how the law can replicate racial inequality. So what are some key tenets 
of critical race theory. So the first is this idea, the race is actually not biologically real, but it is socially real. Let me explain what that means. So first, there, there was this huge human genome project that was conducted in the 1990s. Many of you probably remember this. And they concluded, all of these scientists concluded that we all share, regardless of our racial appearance or perceived race, 99.999% of the same genes. So even though in many ways we are biologically the same, we appear different and our differences have social consequences. They have social consequences for how we are treated in society. Gloria Ladson Billings, who's a scholar, an education scholar, Professor Emeritus from University of Wisconsin, who uses critical race theory in the education context, talks about ideas of conceptual categories of race. So let me give a couple of examples. If I said to you, that school has a lot of at-risk students, you would automatically, all of us, would have an idea of maybe what the race to those students attending that school disproportionately could be, right? If I said that that is a quote-unquote good school, we all might have an idea of, of the predominant race of the students who might attend that school. These are conceptual categories of race, and contrary to what many may think uh, ignoring the reality of race is not uh, a way of addressing racism. Being quote unquote colorblind uh, actually can play a role in perpetuating racial inequality because colorblindness basically says you are not acknowledging the lived experiences of people of color who are treated differently based on their perceived race. And as much as we all uh, would like to believe otherwise, and tr trust me, no one would love to live in a colorblind society more than people of color who are discriminated against based on their race. But unfortunately, racism is normal. It's not aberrant. We all think sometimes of these discrete incidents of racism or these outlier racist people racism can actually seem and appear very rational. Another idea, uh, a tenet of critical uh, race theory is that systems and institutions can actually play a part in perpetuating racial inequality. And, and Mr. Johns talked about this a little bit. So if we say, what does that actually mean? How can a system like the education system actually be racist? Well, if we move away from individual bad actors, and that's not to say that there aren't individual racist people. Yes, there are individual racist people. But when racism becomes institutionalized, when it's embedded into law, when it's embedded into policy, that's when it does the work of perpetuating inequality. Uh, so we think about, uh, Mr. Johns also uh, brought up the, the uh, example of a racially, what are called in legal terms, racially restrictive covenants or redlining. Uh, this was a practice that was predominant in this country and actually uh, perpetuated even by the federal government, where areas where people of color live were uh, ascribed lower property values, people of color were prevented from moving to certain neighborhoods. And yes, there were actual legal documents, and I'll show an uh, example of one in a moment, stating that uh, certain homes could not be sold to people who are non-white. Uh, and relegating people of color, therefore, to certain neighborhoods that were given lower property values because education funding in most jurisdictions is generated through property taxes. If you live in an area that has been ascribed a lower property value, even if you tax yourself at a higher rate, you often will not be able to generate enough funds to really have uh, robust educational resources. This is how inequality can be embedded and can be replicated through systems, practices, and institutions. And I'm sure many of you all are thinking, well, that was so long ago. It may have been long ago, but these practices are so deeply embedded 
in our nation, in our history, uh, we still see residential segregation along racial lines, drawing of school district boundaries along racial lines. And so therefore it is perpetuated, it's replicated, uh, and it unfortunately deepens uh, over time. And so this is the uh, another tenet of critical race theory. Law is not merely regulating race and race relations, but is actively constituting race and race relations. Again, we look early during this uh, period when Black people were enslaved for so many years, where we see the roots of these ideas about Black inferiority originated during this period of, of legal slavery because it's really hard to oppress and, and dehumanize people who you think of as equals. So in many ways, these ideas were to rationalize this system first of slavery and later of uh, legal segregation and now what we call in legal terms de facto or segregation, racial uh, segregation uh, in practice. I love this quote by uh, law professor Kiara M. Bridges. Uh, she teaches at UC Berkeley. Race has never been solely about bodies. Rather, it has always been about what those bodies mean in terms of mental, emotional, and political capacities. So the perceptions, people's perceived race, uh, races have consequences. This is an example uh, of a racially restrictive covenant. You can see the language here. And again, these were legal instruments for a very long time. No property in said addition shall at any time be sold, conveyed, rented, or leased in whole or in part to any person or persons not of the white or Caucasian race. So you add other discriminatory practices like the denial of mortgages and loans to people of color. These practices build on each other and the inequality compounds over time. But I think that uh, Crenshaw can even better explain critical race here. I just wanna play a very short one minute video uh, uh, that is produced by the African-American Policy Forum. If you Google critical race theory today, you're likely to encounter a slew of misinformation and fear mongering from the right. Critical race theory is a Marxist doctrine that rejects the vision of Martin Luther King Jr. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school does not mean that I'm a racist. CRT looks beyond individual acts of racism and bigotry and instead grapples with the structures and histories that have embedded racism into law and more broadly into society. Developed by a diverse group of anti-racist legal scholars in the 70s and 80s, Critical race theory is a practice, a way of seeing connections between America's racial history and present day inequality. We can't fight for racial justice if we can't see, speak, and learn about racial injustice. Okay. And so let's think again if of the Google education Google context. Today, Excuse me. You're likely to. Um, and Mr. John shared this as well, but just a couple of ways to look at this within the context of public education. So we have curriculum, what we deem worthy uh, of, of students focusing on and learning, which ironically is a little bit of the focus here of, of critical race theory and the discussions about critical race theory. Uh, instruction, whom we deem worthy of learning, Right when we see students of color who are uh, approached as if they're in constant need of remediation, uh, how they're taught, how students of color are often re uh, relegated to lower level courses. Uh, assessments, narrow assessments that take no account of inputs. I mentioned earlier some of the resource inequities driven by how schools are funded. Uh, and so all students, regardless of the resources you have access to, are judged on these same narrow assessments, the results of which are used to justify these myths about the limited intellectual capacity of students of color. And of course, the school funding inequities that are perpetuated uh, by reliance on property taxes and uh, uh, local funding. Uh, and of course, segregation as well. 
Now, let's just take a, a step back here. How did we get here about critical race theory? Why is there even a conversation? So this is a quote by conservative uh, activist Christopher Rufo, and he says, we have successfully frozen their brand, quote, critical race theory. I'm not sure critical race theory really was a brand, but this is a quote, into the public conversation or, and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. So this is actually an orchestrated campaign. It's an example of what's known as agnotology, uh, which is a study of willful acts to spread confusion and deceit, right? Uh, usually to sell a product or win favor. So this is really about a misinformation campaign uh, that comes on the hills, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, of the summer of 2020, where we witnessed protests, widespread demonstrations by people of all racial backgrounds in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. These are photos from a demonstration in the UK. We had a uh, significant election uh, and uh, profound participation by uh, people of color. Uh, and as was noted earlier in the first presentation, critical race theory is actually not usually taught in K through 12 schools. I actually wish it were. Uh, I have a, a quote I love from my Georgetown law colleague, uh, Gary Peller. Uh, and he, he notes, if teachers were able to teach such analytically difficult ideas to public school students, it should be a cause for wild celebration, right? Uh, and not denunciation. But unfortunately, what's happening while we're focused on, on this orchestrated uh, campaign against critical race theory and this fear of having these conversations about race and inequality in public school, schools, our children are falling behind. Uh, Mr. John shared some data about uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. I'll, I'll just say, share a couple of uh, statistics from national data. Uh, according to a 2019 Education Week report uh, uh, examining U.S. student performance, the performance of 15-year-olds on the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, 15-year-olds uh, from the U.S. perform, quote, unquote, proficient on reading, which is actually not great. That means that the average 15-year-old uh, could understand the main idea and draw basic inferences in a moderately long text, but, and I quote, would struggle to understand and compare texts that included multiple features or competing ideas as required for the next proficiency level of reading. Uh, and this, these are kind of skills that are required in a world with increasingly complex reading demands. And I would even posit, unfortunately, many of our students don't have the, the reading skills or the analytical skills to actually even grapple with critical race theory. Math is just as bad. Uh, the United States had a smaller pool of the highest performers and a bigger share of the lowest performers than the average for all tested countries. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, noted that students can now find many answers to questions online. Uh, my, my aunt, who teaches a sixth grade science at a magnet school in Houston, can tell you this. Students will go to whatever wiki, whatever page it is, and come up with it and copy it and think that that's the answer. But, and I quote from this report, but it is up to them to figure out what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong. Reading is no longer mainly about extracting information. It is about constructing knowledge, thinking critically and making well found judgments. And so these outcomes are a result of many factors, including broad disinvestment in public education, according to the Education Law Center. In the decade following the Great Recession, students across the US lost nearly $600 billion 
from states disinvestment in public schools. And many states still have not returned to pre-2008 levels of school funding. We also see, of course, widespread um, uh, uh, teacher shortages, many students, particularly students concentrated, students of color and students from low income families who are concentrated in under resourced schools, lack access to qualified and experienced educators, and of course, persistent segregation, among other factors that play a role in perpetuating uh, uh, these kind of outcomes among all of our students. Uh, and it's interesting, the founders of our country recognize that our nation's form of democracy, a Republican form of democracy required an educated citizenry who could really engage uh, in, in public life. Uh, and what's interesting, I mentioned how, uh, or maybe I didn't mention this, uh, during the period of slavery, black, it was a crime in many states for black people to learn how to read or write, not just enslaved black people, in some places, even black people who were free. It wasn't until the Civil War, the brief period known as Reconstruction, that we even saw the roots of our contemporary education system. This is a photo, an early photo of some of the black men, uh, emancipated black men who were elected to the US Congress during this period of reconstruction. Ironically, these men, the very men who have been denied education, led the charge in the creation of our modern day public education system. And by the way, it wasn't just enslaved black people, it was a crime for uh, many black people to learn how to read or write, but many white people from low income families went without education as well. Wealthy or white families could pay to have their children educated. These men led the charge for the creation of clauses outlining state responsibility for the provision of education in their home states. So revered did education become at this time that it became a requirement for states to include a clause uh, outlining the provision of education in order to be readmitted to the union after the Civil War. And they did it. And they did it not just because it was a precondition, but because they also recognized the significance and the importance of the provision of public education. Many historians now believe that had education been more widely available, we likely never would have had a civil war. And I wanna end with this last slide here. This is a, um, uh, a Holocaust Memorial in Germany. Uh, Brian Stevenson, who's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, talks often of traveling to Germany. And he says, you can't walk a couple of feet without coming across across a memorial or a plaque recognizing the Holocaust, uh, memorializing it, addressing it. German students are required to learn about the Holocaust in schools, not to cast German people in a bad light, but to understand the circumstances and the conditions that led to the Holocaust to prevent a horror like that uh, from happening again. So I emphasize all of this just to underscore the importance of public education, the importance of acknowledging racial inequality and its vestiges that are still present in our school systems today. And we really can't afford uh, to participate in the violence of organized forgetting. Thank you all. Thank you, Janelle. And now we'll move on to the question and answer portion of the evening, which will be led by Amelia Brust. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, once again, if you want to ask questions, you can do that by um, typing it in the Q&A uh, box and uh, hit enter or send. And we will answer as many questions as we can, but we are scheduled to end at 8.30. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first question I want to ask um, is for, I think, Stephanie and Rochelle. Um, you mentioned how you're defining um, racism 
and uh, and I believe bias in the audit, but how do you uh, plan to define equity or how do you plan to measure equity in the audit? So that's a great question. So equity, when we talk about equity or what equity means, equity is the giant umbrella. This is how we kind of explain it to people because there's a lot of different terms that people, you probably have heard from uh, social justice, cultural proficiency, um, racism, anti-racism, all of that. We think of equity as the broad umbrella and all of those items underneath that are components. When we think about equity, we want to make sure that we define it different, differently than equality. Equality means that everyone is getting the same thing, right? When we talk about equity, it's about everyone getting what they need to be successful. The anti-racist audit is one component of that. And it is focused on race. But we also identify the fact that there's a lot of intersectionality that exists um, outside of just race that can contribute to someone's lived experience. And we believe that through the process of going through the anti-racist audit, which does have a focus on race, it will fundamentally benefit everyone in the long term to ensure that everybody is getting what they need when it comes to equity. Great, thank you. Um, you also mentioned that in the surveys that you plan to administer, you're trying to make sure that the questions are age appropriate uh, for different grade levels. Um, do you possibly have any examples of what a question might look like for a fourth grader versus a ninth grader. Um, and I, I kind of also want to add my own uh, question onto that. How are you planning to factor in um, possibly language barriers or uh, language learners when you conduct the audit and audit? And I don't just mean that for students. I also mean that for their parents um, who will be a uh, who presumably will uh, get some reach out from the district, but for those who are maybe um, not English fluent or are not used to this type of communication from their children's school might be a little bit hesitant to participate in the surveys. Absolutely, Amelia, and that is a fantastic question all around. So I wanna make sure that I hit all parts of it. So if I don't, please, please bring me back. Um, so first, I don't, I don't have actual examples right handy to share with you in the differences between the fourth and fifth and the secondary. But what I can tell you is that the fourth and fifth survey has um, probably less than half of the questions um, total of that they would have to answer. It was also vetted through PTA members um, from a variety of PTA members. It was also vetted so they were parents that were involved um, and also educators in the fourth and fifth graders to make sure that it was age appropriate for them and, and what was being asked and how it was being asked. So there was a, a, a process that we engaged in to ensure the age appropriateness. Regarding the language barriers, I first wanna say that um, our surveys are being translated into all of our languages, all seven of our main priority languages within the system. We also are gonna be providing supports, and I'll talk about the students first. When you think about um, ESOL students, for instance, that might not be native to the United States taking that survey, they will be provided, their teachers are going to be providing resources to give them some background understanding of what the survey is. And they also will be able to take it in their language if it's one of our seven languages, or and as well as receive all of the accommodations that they would normally receive as, as they were engaging in a class activity of some sort. So we wanna make sure that's also true for, even for our special education students so that they can participate as well. Regarding our parent, our parent community, we are actively working right now um, with different organizations um, and advocacy groups within our community to do a couple things. One, to get the word out um, about the survey. We recently had um, some meetings with, and, and Byron knows, we had a meeting with the NAACP Parents, uh, Parents Council as well as MCC PTA board in order to create some communication plans on how we are uh, communicating out. We're also in the process of working with our comms department in order to determine how can we get this survey to some of our trusted partners and that they could help the community members complete the survey and help create that understanding, especially in light of the fact that we know that some people don't feel trustful of something like this. 
So we really are working actively um, with a variety of organizations and groups to really help us create that knowledge, understanding, and when once we launch, help people actually complete it that are interested in completing it. So we're working on that um, collaboratively right now. Great, thank you. Um, and so uh, one of our attendees asked um, how that outreach could extend to uh, PTAs. And um, so I'm just wondering then if uh, that is going to be part of the outreach. Absolutely. In fact, um, all of our um, outreach has already been, we've been actively working with MCC PTA um, and other parent organizations. We have an anti-racist audit steering committee that started last January um, when we began the audit process that has been meeting with us monthly and has been integral in actually developing the anti-racist audit. And like I said before, uh, we recently met with MCC PTA board of directors um, and they are working with us on a communication plan to get all of the information out about the audit and in particularly about the surveys to all of our local PTAs. And we're also working with our NAACP parent council um, as well as other community organizations to help reach all of our parents and our constituents. Great, thank you. Um, Byron, I wanted to um, ask you if you uh, see um, at the moment ways to better Im to improve the types of supports that uh, parents and families um, may need in MCPS, or if you see, um, you know, a, an opportunity or, or a resource that they already have that is really great for them being a part of furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion for not only their own children, but for all the kids in their in their kids' school or in their community schools. Yeah, thank you for that. So there are a couple of areas. Um, again, the Parents Council, for those of you who don't, aren't aware, has operated um, since about 25 years now. It's been a parent, an NAACP, uh, typically a parent, but sometimes a community member, uh, in each of the 209 schools. And this year, we actually started uh, a parents council for the two virtual academies. So that has, um, you know, grown. That's that's a whole other aspect of this. So how do parents get involved? Certainly, um, working the PTA is certainly very, very involved. Um, there are you know, there's a long history with, uh, within some communities that PTAs don't always represent the interests of, of minority groups. So hence the Parents Council, uh, the NAACP stood up, uh, and more recently the Black and Brown Coalition uh, came together where, where both uh, Black communities and Latino, uh, Latinx communities, which find, you know, 80, 90 percent of the issues are shared. Um, uh, the co-founder is Diego Uruburu with Identity, and, and he and I um, have developed this term, you know, for decades now. We seem to find we're advocating side by side. In many ways, our communities were, you know, competing to see uh, who could do worse in which, you know, which category. And so we came together to really look at things. And one of the areas that's important that we're looking at an MCPS has been very warm in, in receiving is to engage the families that are traditionally marginalized. Um, many families are used to how to communicate using how to get their voices heard, showing up at board meetings, a uh, number of things. We really have um, glad to have MCPS's efforts towards including more voices, those who are often not heard from, and not only at the end of an, of an effort or program, but in the very design up front. So asking them to be, uh, include the voices in the planning uh, up front and not just um, feedback after it's done. So we think there's a lot to be done. I think this anti-racist audit, I think the point was made though very clearly it, it is important now to look at what we do with the data. Um, and I would tell you, for instance, what we did with the data showing that um, students who were getting the high, black and brown students 
who were getting the highest scores in the prerequisite tests were not being referred to the advanced courses at the same rate. Um, the very next year, that policy, the policy changed, and a significant uh, improved. Basically, it was uh, close to parity, and we're looking to make sure that's institutionalized. So it's important to advocate, to pay attention to these areas, and to um, advocate for them. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that uh, kind of talk about budgeting and um, geographic boundaries and how that could factor into, um, into bias or disparities in the district. So um, I'm wondering if uh, those things, school spending and um, possibly uh, geographic boundaries or redistricting, since that is also something that MCPS is looking at right now, um, how those could factor into the audit results. I think what's important to, to remember is that the audit is the data collection process that will help inform all parts of our system. So although we're not doing like a comprehensive, the anti-racist audit doesn't include like a comprehensive analysis of our budget or, or boundary studies, which we know we have engaged in boundary studies um, in the past at MCPS. The purpose of the audit is really to get on the granular level and really collect that street data that can help inform the stories of the students and the families and our community in order to then impact the rest of our system. That could include thinking about how we are budgeting or allocating our resources uh, to students based on the findings that we, that we receive. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, this may have been mentioned in the presentation, but um, does the, uh, does the audit plan to uh, review curriculum across all grades and how that curriculum could be affected by, um, by institutional bias? But I also kind of want to pair that with a question for Janelle. Um, do you, have, you have you seen in your research any possible limitations um, coming from like state boards of education, like from Maryland State Board of Education that could be getting in the way or slowing down um, teachers and schools' abilities to even teach concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion, aside from using an actual critical race theory framework. But just is there some, do you see some kind of limitation on what teachers can even do at the moment that is preventing these principles from moving forward in education at the K through 12 level. So that's kind of a, a dual book question for, for Janelle, Stephanie, and, and Rochelle. Okay, well, uh, Stephanie and Rochelle, why don't you start and then I, I guess I'll follow up. <laughs> sure, sure, thank you, Janelle. So one thing I wanted to mention outside of the audit was that MCPS, as it pertains to the curriculum, has been embarking on this journey way before the anti-racist audit. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we were actually highlighted on NBC for the amount of work we were doing in terms of making the curriculum more inclusive, more accessible, and really focusing on the rights and the history of indigenous peoples, African-American, African-Americans and our students have been heavily involved in working with that as well as our curriculum office. So that work has already begun and the curriculum office through social studies and making its way through a variety of the content areas. As a matter of fact, we've already started down that road. I think the audit will only help us to really bear out those areas where we need to continue to in a robust way, really um, I think the application gap, right? So you can change the curriculum, but then you also have to focus on training the individuals who are in the classrooms teaching, making sure that they have an understanding of it and they're conveying it in a way that's meaningful and really will push the needle on this going forward. So uh, I wanted to mention that. 
Yeah, and I would I'd just say briefly in terms of restrictions. So several states have passed uh, legislation or introduced measures or taken other steps to restrict uh, uh, the teaching of critical race theory or limit how educators can discuss racism or sexism in the classroom. Uh, there are educators who have been fired, school leaders who have been uh, fired as well and have lost their jobs. So many jurisdictions, there are some restrictions on what kind of discussions can take place in the classroom and how those discussions uh, should be conducted. Uh, I think what's important is actually what was just mentioned, providing educators with supports, with training, with ongoing support and training about how to not only um, facilitate inclusive classrooms, uh, but, um, uh, discipline practices, other areas uh, uh, of, of uh, classroom management that are really important, right, and that have implications for overall uh, school climate. So I think really looking at resources, looking at supporting uh, educators, um, and also focusing on teaching students critical thinking overall, like analytical thinking, uh, are all really important. Great, thank you so much. Jenny, do you think we have time for one more question? Great. <laughs> okay. Um, so I uh, kind of wanted to then ask about um, the staff supports um, at MCPS. And um, I'm kind of interested to know uh, if, uh, the audit will sort of address differences in, in experiences and differences in support for uh, maybe newer and veteran teachers as well as senior and junior uh, staff at MCPS. Um, and if these groups are gonna be surveyed or, or interviewed together, or if they're going to be um, spoken to separately to best gauge their, um, their thoughts and experiences for the um, data gathering portion of the audit? That's a great question, Amelia. And the answer is, is yes. Um, we are going to be talking about, talking to various different staff members of, of various different experience levels from support services all the way to administrators. Um, the other thing to note is that, you know, so right now we're actually are in the process of figuring out what our focus groups are going to be. Um, and a lot of that is going to be based on some of the preliminary data that has already been collected to figure out what voices we may not have heard, what issues we might need to dig into deeper based on what the data has said, so that we can be really strategic about um, the focus groups that are being conducted. The other thing just to note, and because you mentioned something, and I'm not quite sure this if this is what you meant or not, but when you said like the support structures for teachers or a staff of various um, experience levels. Um, and when it comes to our work around equity, um, we really do, even you know, outside of the audit, the system across the board really does uh, communicate and provide resources to, to all staff members of all different job you know, descriptions, et cetera, um, to help expand their own knowledge and understanding of how to be a culturally responsive and equitable educator. In fact, we have a wonderful program that our director of professional growth systems put together for um, our, our new teachers during new teacher induction and really orients them um, about the experience of being a new educator in a diverse community and what that means for them as educators. So we really did have tried to, over the years, provide a lot of resources in a lot of different ways um, to support everyone from an administrator to support staff. Great. Thank you so much. And I think that's going to have to conclude the Q&A portion of tonight. Um, but we will have this video up um, on our website and our YouTube channel later. And uh, MCPS does have more information on its audit um, on their website as well. So Jenny, uh, take it away. Thank you to all of our esteemed presenters. And thank you to everyone watching tonight. If you enjoyed this free program and want to learn more about the League of Women Voters work in Montgomery County, 
You can find out more about us, including how to support our efforts at lwvmocomd.org. That's lwvmocomd.org. With that, we will say thank you again and good night.